Hi, my name is Patty Alder. I'm from North Carolina State University, the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. And today I'll be talking with you about cockroach and rodent management in restaurants and other food service facilities. Um, you'll see listed on this slide my contact information. So if you have any questions after the presentation, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, either via email or phone number. So with that, we'll get started um, with pest management in general. What is pest management? One thing that um, you need to keep in mind if, is that all pests need the same things that we do, food, water, and shelter. So any way we can minimize access or get rid of access to food, water, and shelter to pests is a form of pest management. So that includes things like sanitation and what we refer to as exclusion. Sanitation is pretty straightforward, um, especially in places like restaurants, food service facilities. They want to make sure that they're following proper sanitation protocol and keeping things nice and clean. Um, and by doing that, that in and of itself minimizes access of food and water to certain pests. So that is a, a form or a method that we can use um, integrated in the rest of our pest management strategies. The other one we look at a lot is exclusion. Um, and that's just um, when we look at uh, the outside of a building and look at ways that pests might be getting into those buildings. So in other words, if you were looking at an exterior door uh, and you saw light coming underneath the bottom of the door, then that would be an easy way for a pest to get in, especially for something like a cockroach. Even some uh, a mouse could get in there quite easily. Um, so just closing up that gap or exclusion um, is another uh, method of pest management, pest management that we can incorporate into our management strategy. So with sanitation and exclusion, as you can see on the slide here, they work together to deny pests access to food, water, and shelter, and correct conditions that are conducive to pest problems, or that provide them with suitable entry points and habitats. So even within the building, I'll show you on the next slide here how um, restaurants, other food service facilities um, can do exclusion practices within the building. I'll show you that now. So the picture on the left, uh, what you're seeing is in a restaurant and um, it's actually in the kitchen area. And it's just a whiteboard there where they had taken notes down and, and whatnot. But you can see where the arrows are pointing, that's a line of caulk right there. That's because at one point they had some cockroaches living behind that whiteboard. So they were able to clean up out from behind there um, and then seal that up. So that is really a form of exclusion just within the building. So it's just minimizing access to that area there that those cockroaches, cockroaches were using uh, for harborage or shelter. The other thing, like I mentioned before, is looking on the outside of your building. Um, you can see there that exterior door. It looks pretty good. I don't see it's It's kind of far away. But you can see if you were to get up closer, there's not a lot of gaps around that door. So that's kind of what you want. The other thing that's kind of common sense here, if you look at the this picture on the right, you'll also see the dumpster there. Um, and that's a good place for the dumpster because it's close to the exterior of the building, which is very convenient for employees. Um, but with that, it's even more important to make sure that those doors remain closed back there when, when no one's coming in and out of the building and that those um, doors are don't have any gaps around them, because especially with the dumpster being that close by, um, you could potentially have pests coming around nearby. So other things we include would be um, dry storage facilities and making sure that things are stored properly. Um, you can see the picture on the upper left there um, that's what a lot of restaurants will do with bulk storage, dry storage. They will store it in these pest-proof bins, uh, and that's what you'd want to do. That will minimize access or prevent access 
um, for pets, for pests, um, for that dry storage or that, uh, that dry uh, bulk storage there. Um, other things uh, we recommend is that uh, deliveries are inspected outside the storage area. A lot of times, as, as you'll see when we start talking specifically about cockroaches, um, there is one that, that likes to live inside with people. The number one that, get in, that gets into restaurants um, is the German cockroach. And so it doesn't really live outside in this, in this part of the, in the United States at all. So it hitchhikes. So that's how, even if someone had a clean food service facility, a cockroach could hitchhike um, on a delivery. So we, we always recommend that those deliveries are um, inspected outside before they're brought in and kind of unloaded into that storage area. That'll help minimize movement of any potential hitchhikers. Um, storing susceptible items properly. We've already mentioned that there um, with the picture of the, the storage, the, the plastic bins there with the storage for um, dry goods. So doing things like that, um, it doesn't have to be anything that big. It can be as simple as putting some flour um, in a Ziploc bag, putting it in the refrigerator um, or something like that. Cleaning up spills as soon as possible. This is important too. So anytime someone in uh, a restaurant food service facility has a spill, you know, they want to try to get that cleaned up as soon as possible. Um, and if you see this dry storage area here again up on the upper left, you notice that the shelves are up off the floor and that's usually pretty standard protocol. They want those shelves off the floor so they can see if anything uh, has spilled underneath there and they can, can clean that up and, and make sure that's moved out of there. Um, first in, first out um, is another term um, used often with restaurants, food service facilities. Just means that we want to use the older stock first uh, before newing, using the newer stock and discard it and discard infested expired products. And just another side note here, the picture on the upper right um, was actually a coffee shop in um, one of the, in, on campus, NC State campus. And when they closed up at night, they made sure that they wrapped up all of this um, syrup and, and things like that because um, Ant, they were having a problem with ants getting in and being attracted to any of that syrup that would spill there during the day. So they made sure they kept that nice and clean and during the evening they would just seal it all up pretty tight like that. And that really goes a long way with managing pests. So um, most, if not all, food service facilities are going to work with a professional pest management company and contract out with them to do their uh, pest management. So what the pest management company would do would come in and do things like inspections. That would be physically looking around with a flashlight, um, talking to um, the people that work in the food service facility to see, you know, kind of what they've experienced since their last visit. Sometimes they will keep a pest log that the pest management professional can look at when, when they come to the visit when they come to do each service. Um, monitoring too would be, in, in addition to a pest log, would we use uh, traps. A lot of those, what we use for cockroaches are sticky traps. And I'll show you some pictures of those when we get to cockroaches. Um, they're really excellent at um, letting someone know when they have a problem that's just getting started. Um, or and or they can also tell you uh, the distribution of your pest population. So they're very, very um, tra trapping. Sticky traps are, are very good for, for pest management and they're always, almost always used in food service facilities as part of a monthly contract with a professional. And then sometimes we will need to use insecticide treatments. So this is another thing that the pest management professional will be responsible for. And when we do those treatments or the company will do those treatments, they need to be targeted. So in other words, uh, because it is a food service facility, you know, there's food prep going on, there's fruit, food um, utensils, there may be food sitting out on the counter. So a lot of times they're limited to what they can use 
in food service facilities and when they do use insecticides they're almost always used in a targeted way to minimize that risk of any exposure and we'll go over that a little bit more when we start talking about some of the specific uh, ways we manage cockroaches. So what you see on this page or on this slide are, are the portions that the pest management professional is responsible for. So it really is kind of like a team effort between the food service facility and the pest management professional with the pest, man pest management professional coming in usually monthly and doing their inspections, looking at the sticky traps, using insecticides as needed. And then the food service facility, their responsibilities are going to be some of the things we talked about earlier, like making sure they're following proper sanitation. Um, they're using good exclusion practices to keep pests out of the building and things like that. So it really is a partnership uh, between those two. Okay, so let's now get into the nitty gritty here and start looking at some of these pests. So cockroaches in general um, have what we call a three stage life cycle. So they have an egg stage, uh, the nymph stage, that's just the immature stage and the adult stage. Interestingly, um, with cockroaches, the female makes an egg case. Uh, and you can see pictures of cockroach egg cases there on the right. Those are from different species. But she will then deposit her eggs inside that egg case. We call that egg case an ootheca. And it can contain anywhere from 12 eggs to 30 plus eggs, depending on the species. Uh, for instance, uh, let's see if I can should we get this to show up here? Yeah, this um, light tan uh, egg case here, the long skinny one on the right, um, is from the German cockroach. And each female uh, will produce multiple egg cases during her life. And each one of those egg cases can contain uh, 30 to 40 eggs per egg case. So she can make a lot of little cockroach babies and also, German cockroaches have a very short life cycle, so um, usually it's about three months. So it doesn't take a long time um, for a newly hatched nymph or immature to reach adulthood and start reproducing itself. So you can build up an infestation relatively quickly um, if you've got the right um, uh, you know, temperature uh, food availability, water, all the right conditions, um, you can get a, an infestation built up pretty quickly. Cockroaches generally are active mostly at night and they like warm, dark, moist places. So um, they're going to be ten, tend to be found in areas, that's why a lot of times they like kitchens because obviously there's food in there, um, water, and a lot of the equipment um, you, uh, makes heat, generates heat. So you think about refrigerators, microwaves, um, stoves, all of those uh, ref, um, generate heat. And a lot of times it's not uncommon for us to pull out a refrigerator somewhere uh, and if we're looking at an account with German cockroaches and they'll be living kind of behind um, the refrigerator, own the refrigerator, and nestled in there any, any way they can on the outside of the refrigerator wherever there's any cracks and crevices. So they like that warmth. So we're going to start here. We're going to look at three different cockroach species uh, that we see commonly. Um, the first one is the German cockroach, and this is the one that I mentioned that is going to be the one that uh, most likely will set up an infestation indoors. So they're not associated with outdoor infestations. They only live indoors with humans. So these are the number one pests we have in people's homes, restaurants, and facilities like that. Um, the adults are about half inch long, um, and then they have two dark stripes on the area directly behind the head. You can see it right here. Let's see if I can get this going again. Um, Right there, two black stripes, this area behind the head, this little round shield looking thing is called a pronotum. Um, and then you can tell this is a female here. She has an egg case attached to her seal. And now interestingly, the female German cockroach will carry her head, egg case with her all the way up until about 24 hours before the eggs hatch. So in terms of a cockroach, she is a good cockroach mother. 
Um, a lot of other cockroaches will make their egg case and then they'll drop it after a couple of days, usually in a hidden or secluded area. But the German cockroach, she will hold on to that thing until right near the very end. And while she's carrying that egg case, she doesn't forage very much. So she tends to hide out in cracks and crevices. So she keeps herself and her eggs very protected. So as I mentioned before, the life cycle spans about 100 days. So we're looking at about three months for the life cycle for the German cockroach. Now they live in aggregations or clusters. So it's kind of icky if you've ever seen a moderate or severe infestation. So the picture right here on the right um, is typically what they'll do. They aggregate together. You can see the different stages there. There's an adult right here. It's larger with wings. And then the smaller ones kind of scattered all around there without wings are the nymphs or immatures. And you'll see different size nymphs um, because they grow and go through different stages as they grow until finally they reach adulthood and they don't grow anymore. Um, and so when they grow to the next stage, um, their um, exoskeleton, all insects have an exoskeleton, they wear their skeleton on the outside. When they grow underneath to the next stage, they kind of bust out of that old exoskeleton because it doesn't fit them anymore. Um, and then they'll kind of be hanging around for a little bit, kind of um, light colored. I'll show you a picture on the next slide of one that's kind of just molted. It looks white. It's very light colored. Um, but over time, that new exoskeleton will harden and darken. And the reason I'm mentioning all this is that is one of the signs of infestation sometimes of a German cockroach is to see the old shed skins. The other one obviously would be seeing cockroaches like you see here and then seeing their fecal material. You can see it kind of the little black dots like it almost looks like little pepper all over the refrigerator or whatever that appliance is. That's a perfect place for them like I was telling you in an earlier slide. Um, that's where they like to hang out. Um, so that's what you'll see a lot of times. That's typical for their behavior. And as I mentioned, the, um, their habitat is primarily, but not strictly, areas with moisture. So in food and water, obviously, but um, they need moisture. So kitchens, bathrooms, etc. You will see some uh, exceptions to that from time to time. So um, this is another picture. You can see them kind of scattered all over the wall there. But again, they like to hang out together. You can see the poop on the wall. That's kind of what it would look like. Um, and you can see up here the one I was telling you about that's just molted. A lot of times we ha have people tell us that they, they say, I saw an albino cockroach. And that's generally what it is. There's not really, there's no such thing as an albino cockroach. Um, but it, what they're probably seeing is a newly molted cockroach, and that will harden and darken over time, as I mentioned, over a few hours, really. Um, they're very good at hiding in cracks and crevices. They actually, cockroaches, like to be wedged into small spaces. They like to have um, something touching the tops and bottoms of their bodies, um, so that's not uncommon. Um, they, they move through wall voids, so... As I mentioned, cockroaches, they don't, German cockroaches, I should say, um, don't live outside in this area. So um, if your neighbor across the street has German cockroaches, even your neighbor directly across from you um, on the same side of your, or directly beside you on your road or whatever in your neighborhood, um, German cockroaches are not going to walk from inside their house and come over to your house and get into your house. Uh, in that instance, they would hitchhike, as I mentioned. So your neighbor might come to visit you for dinner and bring a bag and they have German cockroaches and they accidentally bring some to your house. So that, that could happen. Um, that's, that's the only way they would get from house to house in a situation like that. The bigger problem with cockroaches is multi-unit um, dwellings. So they can easily move through wall voids. So if you've got an apartment building and one apartment has German cockroaches, then they can move to an adjacent apartment building or up to another floor or down another floor. So that is possible. They will move some distances like that. Um, so if you are a restaurant slash food service facility and say uh, a strip mall or you, you share space with other people, 
um, then it is possible that cockroaches can move around in a building that way in a situation like that. So this is the other one um, that we were going to talk about, the American cockroach. This is larger than the German cockroach, and this cockroach also occurs usually outside. So adults are about an inch and a half long. They're reddish brown. And if you look at their pronotum, this area here right behind the head that looks like a shield, um, it's reddish brown with a lighter edge. Okay, and the reason I'm bringing this up is the next cockroach we look we're going to look at looks pretty similar to this one, but the pronotum is all brown. So that's one easy way we can tell those two apart just by looking at them outside. So they have a really long lifespan. It can span up to 600 days. So that's a lot longer than what we saw with the German cockroach. So infestations can build up with these, but it will generally take longer. And again, this is a cockroach that likes to be outside and occasionally invades indoors. So they don't normally set up a true infestation indoors. That doesn't mean you won't see them inside sometimes, you know, and that, that's what people don't want. So that's the main thing. But just knowing that um, they don't, usually an infestation is going to be located outside, um, that's where the control efforts usually need to be um, aimed at, is outdoors. So they do like dark, warm, moist areas. They can get into places like unfinished basements, um, crawl spaces, uh, grease traps. They're attracted to grease traps, sewers, and heat tunnels. So here's some of the places that we've seen German cockroaches um, before. The, the picture on the bottom left here is actually North Carolina State campus. And um, it's a sewer tunnel there. And if you open that up, it's loaded with American cockroaches. That's the kind of habitat they love. Um, even a mop bucket here that's just got a little bit of water left in it. And there's a floor drain here. They can pop up through some of these plumbing pipes and be attracted to that water. Other types of floor drains. So these are, are just areas that you might find American cockroaches attracted to. And this is just so, showing you a close-up of that sewer tunnel with the American cockroaches in it. And last but not least, with the three cockroaches we're going to look at is the smoky brown cockroach. So you can see it looks very similar to the one we just saw, which was the American cockroach. It's about the same size, maybe just a little bit smaller. It's an inch and a fourth long, but you can see this area behind the head here, the pronotum is just a solid dark brown color. So that's how you know it's not the American cockroach. Um, they can fly pretty easily and they sometimes are attracted to light. So it's not uncommon at night for them to fly over to someone's house if they have their lights on inside or if they have a porch light on and be attracted to porches and kind of hang around on your deck or porch, which isn't fun if you're hanging out there with your friends. And if you've got a big gap in your door or something like that, they can be attracted in, inside toward that light. So that's where exclusion becomes really important. Now with the smoky cockroach, the female actually produces her otheca and she hides it in cracks and crevices, just like we see with American cockroach, but oftentimes the smoky brown cockroach will glue hers on surfaces. And the lifespan ranges a little bit more than 320 days generally is the average. So again, these like to be outside, so usually you're not going to have an a true infestation indoors unless it's something like an unfinished basement, uh, a crawl space, a garage, uh, an outbuilding. Uh, again, sometimes we run into exceptions, but generally speaking, they like to be outside. They are attracted to gutters, so clogged gutters they love. So you see the picture there on the upper left. They love that type of thing. Roof overhangs, they like to get under decks under moist shaded areas that have thick ground cover. So those, those are areas outdoors that they're attracted to. So if we go back now, and since we are in food service facilities, um, from time to time, they may have some of the larger cockroaches come in that we just looked at, those last two. Generally speaking, if, those, if they're seeing those indoors, it's, it's a random one here and there, and generally the 
control efforts need to be outside the building, focused outside the building. Now, inside the building, though, the German cockroach is the one that we see most commonly in restaurants and homes and places like that setting up infestations. So knowing what signs of cockroach activity are is going to be important for helping folks um, know when they have an infestation just starting or one is developing um, and it's getting pretty bad, et cetera, et cetera. So some of these we've already looked at and talked about, but the one on the left there, uh, that's more dried fecal smears or, or dried feces. And you can see that's a hinge there. It looks like it's to a big, um, maybe a walk-in freezer or something like that, a refrigerator. And again, with, when that door's closed, there's enough of a gap there. They like to be wedged in there. Uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, egg cases. So sometimes you might see an egg case after the eggs have hatched. You'll just see an egg case, empty egg case, especially with German cockroaches. Um, you can see live or dead insects sometimes, the cockroaches themselves, or the shed skins that we were talking about before. Here's some more pictures of fecal smears and what they might look like. And again, it's not uncommon to see them around places where there's hinges, as you see here on the right. Um, heat, areas that play, or, um, items that generate heat, like this looks like a hot water heater. Uh, and in electrical outlets. So they will come in and out of electrical outlets uh, and move between the walls and things like that, that way. So it's not uncommon to see uh, fecal smears in places like that. Some other areas we sometimes see German cockroaches, you know, again, think water, food, heat, right? So this looks like a dishwashing line. And so you've got water there, you've got heat, you've got some uh, some old food on dirty dishes. So this is an area where they found cockroaches in this. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what this is, but they opened it and you can see here it's got chips in it, computer chips and whatnot. So this thing is going to generate some heat and cockroaches were kind of hanging out and living in there. Floor drains are, are another area anywhere where trash is collected. You see here on the right picture, that is again one of the dorms at NC State and um, that is where trash gets delivered from a trash chute. So trash comes out of the chute from somebody's dorm and it ends up in this, this container here. All good and well until you get, like you see there, everything's collected on the bottom there and if no one cleans that up, that is a very good attractant for not only cockroaches, but rodents, ants, you name it. So keeping it clean is very, very important. Mops, again, places where mops, uh, water is stored or, you know, that needs to be emptied out is what we tell people because even though we might not think it's, you know, wouldn't be very good for us, um, cockroaches and rodents don't mind at all. Um, and then mops, again, make sure hanging mop, mops are hung up to dry like you see on the left here. Um, what happens is if you leave something like this, uh, this mop down here on the floor or someone throws it in the corner in a closet somewhere and forgets about it and it doesn't completely dry, then that mop can start to ferment. And with that, um, that will not only attract cockroaches, but also fruit flies. So that can lead to a problem with fruit flies in addition. So again, with storage areas, we want to do things like um, reducing humidity, checking deliveries, as I mentioned before, common sense type practices. And then sticky traps, as I mentioned before, this is what they look like. And we can use these for monitoring for activity. Um, you can lay them out flat, like you see the picture on the left there. Or you can fold them up and a lot of times folks will fold them up like that because again cockroaches like cracks and crevices so they think they're more apt to go in there. Either way is fine. Um, it, again these are more for monitoring. They obviously will control or kill the cockroaches that get on the sticky trap but usually um, they're going to be used in conjunction with some other control methods. But they are very, very good for monitoring, as I mentioned before. 
Uh, if, if you've got a, a restaurant and you have no cockroaches, your restaurant's clean as a whistle, um, but you get deliveries in and out, and then what's going to happen is your pest management company is going to keep these sticky traps in there regardless of whether or not you have any cockroach activity. That's because at some point down the line, maybe you get a delivery and it's got some cockroaches in it. Pest management comes the next month and sees some cockroaches in the sticky trap and they know at that time that you're just getting, you know, you can go ahead and get a handle on that infestation before it gets too heavy, before it gets too big. So those are very, very good um, for cockroaches, the monitoring traps. Uh, now foggers, we don't um, use these typically in pest, uh, I'm sorry, in food service facilities. Um, at least professionals would not use these because the way they work is the fogger uh, or the bug bomb, some folks call them, releases into the air. It's just a, a very fine aerosol liquid releases into the air and then gravity takes over and all those particles land on horizontal surfaces. So they don't really penetrate cracks and crevices uh, where cockroaches hide, even though it says this right on this on this package, penetrates into cracks, crevices, and carpet fibers. That's just not true unless you were to spray it directly into a crack or crevice, and that's just not how these products work. So we tend to steer people away from using foggers for cockroaches in their homes, just an FYI for you. Um, and there was a study done at NC State along with some other folks that looked at the effic efficacy of um, foggers and in homes and found that they just weren't effective. And that's just because of what I mentioned. Um, the material, the chemical doesn't reach the cracks and crevices where the cockroaches are hiding. So even though these things have cockroaches on the package um, uh, and says it and, and claims that they penetrate cracks and crevices, it, it's just not true. And they're just not very effective um, for German cockroaches. Now, there are some insecticides that the professional pest management uh, company would use in some instances if necessary. They don't uh, use them on a calendar basis. They only use them when needed. So again, that's why that inspection and monitoring comes in so is so important. So um, they also want to try to do it uh, when buildings are not occupied, um, and unless they're doing something like applying a bait, um, like you see on the upper left there, that is a little bait station. So baits are preferred because you can just apply them anytime. Uh, they come in different formulations. That is a station. There's also a gel formulation. Um, they're very easy to apply. You can apply them out of the way. Um, so no one will kind of encounter them. Um, and so they work really white, really great for cockroaches. If we're using any other type of insecticides besides baits, like a liquid spray, for some reason, we want to try to avoid contaminating food and food prep equipment. And you can do that one way by applying it in cracks and crevices, like the gentleman's doing on the right there. Um, so there are specific ways that we can apply pesticides when needed to minimize any potential um, exposure to non-targets. So we can apply them very safely. Um, baiting for cockroaches. Um, these are just showing you some examples here of an area uh, where this technician was baiting uh, underneath a little counter there. And what he's got in his hand is uh, basically it's called a bait gun and the little, it's a tube of gel bait. And it looks like a little uh, miniature tube of caulk if you will, and he slides that into the bait gun and then he can just dab out little drops of that bait gel. It's very, very effective. And you can see where he's applying it. That's because right around that computer and that point of sale machine, there was cockroaches um, in here in these little areas living around that point of sale machine. So again, they like that heat. Very, very uh, attractive to them. So again, baiting is one thing that we really push for German cockroaches. Very, very effective, very easy to use, and you can use it uh, safely in food service facilities. Okay, now I'm going to switch gears here and we're going to talk about rodents. Um, there are just 
three rodents that we typically see here in North Carolina that, that really get in and around people's structures commonly. And one would be the house mouse, number two, the Norway rat, and number three, the roof rat. And these are all pretty easy to tell apart. Um, the house mouse, you know, is going to be real small, cute little thing, if you will. The Norway rat, and we'll get to some sizes here in a little bit, but the Norway rat, if you compare that with the roof rat, the Norway rat is going to be what we call a more robust or beefier rat. Um, the roof rat is kind of more of a slender rat with a pointed nose. I think, yeah, this picture here on the left that just popped up, that's a roof rat. You can see how pointy the nose is and it's more slender um, than the Norway rat is just more robust and has a more blunt nose. And the other thing that's different about the Norway rat and the roof rat is the tail is much longer on the roof rat. If you were to take the tail of the roof rat and pull it up toward its head, it will go past the head or nearly past the head. And the Norway rat, this tail is, too, is much shorter than that. So those are pretty easy to tell apart. <clears throat> so if we look at some numbers here, just some general information, um, there's the size of the Norway rat or, and the roof rat. You can see the length is about the same, but look at the weight difference. So again, that Norway rat is the more robust, larger rat, even though they're about the same length. House mouse, seven inches, and this is nose to tail much uh, weighs much less than than rats and you can see that the gestation periods there weaning sexual maturity so that doesn't take a long time right so again if you've got a mouse having babies um and they, it's not a ma it's only a matter of look 40 days for m mice that's just a little over a month where they are sexually mature and starting to reproduce themselves so it again you can build up an infestation relatively quickly and there's some uh, numbers there on about how long they live as adults. So just some general information there about rodents. The behavior is going to be um, a little more important, too, in terms of control. You know, knowing where these things nest is important um, because that helps us figure out where they're coming from. Mice can nest pretty much anywhere, inside, outside, uh, wall voids, desk drawers, you know, anywhere pantries, anywhere they can get into. Uh, Norway rats generally like to live outside uh, in burrows. Sometimes they can get in walls like foundation voids and things like that. Roof rats like to live up higher, so up in trees um, and sometimes they'll get into attics. The home range for mice is about 10 to 30 feet and for rats 100 to 150 feet. So what that means is Mice will travel uh, anywhere from 10 to 30 feet away from their nest looking for food and water. Uh, rats, that's a huge difference there. 100 to 150 feet, rats are going to go around looking for food and water away from their nest. So that means if you're inspecting for some of these, uh, and if you've got rats, your inspection area just got bigger. Um, mice are what we call nibblers, and rats hoard food. So when we talk about um, ways we manage rodents. One way is um, rodent baits. And so they are toxic to rodents. And so they also can be toxic to people and pets because um, rats and mice are vertebrates, mammals too, like we are. So um, when they ingest, if, if someone, a human or a child, you know, or a pet, a dog or a cat were to ingest some rodent bait, uh, it would affect them like it would uh, rodents. Of course, they'd probably, they would need more, but you got to be very, very careful with the way this bait is placed. And one of the reasons, not only because it affects humans and pets as it does rodents, is because um, rats are hoarders. So if you don't have this stuff stored properly, rats can move it around uh, and they will sometimes drop pieces of it from point A to point B, and then something, some non-target could pick it up. So we'll get into how to properly store bait in a minute here. Um, mice don't need a lot of water every day. They can get a lot of their water from the food they eat, um, but rats have to have water every single day. So a lot of times you'll find them near a water source.
a, a very a constant water source. And mice are pretty inquisitive or curious compared compared to rats. Rats are more neophobic or cautious, wary of new things. So that's going to be something to keep in mind if someone is ever using baits or setting up traps for rodents. Rats generally take longer to investigate because they're a little more cautious. Little more about feeding behavior here. Rats consume about 10% of their body weight on a daily basis and they can feed uh, one to two times in about 24 hours. And not surprisingly, food choices of young rats may be related to the food particles, odors on the female mother rat and they often follow her foraging patterns. So when we manage rodents, you know, it's, we're still using that integrated approach, just like we did with cockroaches, um, where we look at sanitation, proofing or exclusion, and then how do we need to, if we need to get rid of some of these, eradicate some of these rodents, how do we do that? And we'll look at some of those ways. Here are some of the typical places you'll see Norway rats. So if someone's doing an inspection and they're trying to figure out what type of rodent they're dealing with, um, this is typically what Norway rats will do. They'll make a, a nest like this in the ground. This is one near crawl space. That's not uncommon for them to make them near uh, foundation walls like this. And they usually will have more than one opening. So they don't like to get in somewhere and not have an emergency exit, if you will. So they usually be more than one opening. And they also like areas hidden by a lot of clutter. So all this stuff you see scattered up or piled up right here, that'd be a good place for rodents to hide in and live in. Uh, they like areas hidden by landscaping as well. And they also, because they love or have to have water every day, it's not uncommon to see them around storm and wastewater systems. Uh, storm drains too. So there's a dumpster there with lots of food, presumably. Um, and then um, there's a storm drain there, so a water source, potentially. Roof rats, um, again, they also like areas hidden by vegetation, trees, or other landscaping, and they also like higher areas, so it's not uncommon to see them in attics or up in trees. And that picture on the right is just some damage that a roof rat has caused by chewing into something. Mice, um, they, they can nest pretty much anywhere. This is, these are some indoor areas here, um, areas in uh, storage, like, like you see here on the upper left. Uh, it's always a good idea, we tell folks, if they don't need to store them in the boxes, um, to store them outside of those boxes because um, you can't see what's going on in there. Um, if you have something that you can put them in, like a plastic tub, you can put that stuff in, or it's fine to keep things stored in cardboard boxes like that. They were moved around pretty regularly. So if it's some stock that's going to be moving in and out of there pretty quickly, it's not usually going to be an issue. The problem becomes when something sits in a corner somewhere and it's forgotten. That's when mice will generally move into it. And that's an example here. like this picture on the, the bottom here um, was an old box that had been stored somewhere and nobody had used this for a while and mice had set up shop in there. And you know that, you can tell what they've done there is that's nesting material. Mice will shred up material and make a nice little cozy nest with it. And this was a neat situation here on the right um, where it was an elementary school that kept having mice show up in the school. And one of the places they found them living was the vending machine. So again, nice and warm there for them. There's a trash can nearby with some soda. Um, presumably maybe some leftover food, so it was a nice little place for mice to live. That's just showing you some other damage there, chewing damage. Um, other signs of activity would be um, runways. So uh, if you've got a large rat infestation, not even, it doesn't have to be even really that big, but they have a nest somewhere or a burrow and a steady water source, so they're traveling back and forth all the time. It's not uncommon for them to leave trails in the vegetation. The other thing is they will leave sometimes uh, feet marks or tracks in the soil 
or dusty areas indoors like you see here on this in this dusty area right here. Another sign of activity would be rub marks or what we call grease marks. Um, their, their skin is kind of or their fur is kind of oily and rodents don't see very well so they have those whiskers, long whiskers on, on their head so they'll typically travel along walls, corners and they'll once they find a pathway, they'll stick to that pathway if they can. And so they'll leave these little grease or rub marks everywhere that you'll see all these browns, brown on here and on the walls here. Um, there's a spot here and you can see there's some chewing damage here as well, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. There's more chewing damage. That's another sign of activity. Um, when you, you see things like this that are chewed up and, you know, they can chew on them for a variety of reasons. Mice will chew on things and, you know, bring it somewhere else and, and make a little nest there. So that's not uncommon to see. And then their teeth, their front teeth grow a lot. So they're, they're always chewing on things to keep them filed down. One thing you don't want though, is them chewing on an electrical outlet. So, you know, if you get squirrels or something in your attic, it's always a good idea to try to to get those excluded. Droppings would be another thing that you might see as a sign of activity. Um, these are rat droppings on the top. They're much larger um, than the mice droppings that you see down here. I know the size is, is not to scale, but you get the general idea. Um, you can also see urine. This is all urine and fecal material. And what happened in this case was um, it was in an office building and they had um, a rodent infestation and they couldn't get a handle on it and finally found out the rodents were actually living in the drop ceiling. Um, so they just made a big mess up there and the whole thing had to be replaced. So with indoor storage too, it's going to become important like we saw with the cockroaches. Um, the shelves, you know, they either need to be movable and they can be a little closer to the ground if they're not movable, they need to be about 12 inches above the ground. And that, again, is so you can look under there and see what's going on. Have there been any spills under there? Are there any signs of activity, droppings under there? Um, if you wanted to leave a sticky trap under there, you could. So um, good idea to keep those shelves like that up off the ground. Same idea here on the left. It's like a big warehouse where they store a lot of goods. They'll always store the shelves up away from the wall, you know, about 12, inch, 12 to 18 inches. Same kind of principle. They want to be able to access that area and inspect that area. Um, so keeping the landscaping outside um, uh, a certain way can help minimize rodents too. And this is one example. The picture on the left is one of the dining halls at NC State. And they had a problem with not mice, but rats getting into the dining hall. So as you can imagine, there weren't some very happy people going into the dining hall, students or parents, right? And what they found out was um, the rats had made burrows under this thick decorative grass. Um, so they came in and just pulled back about 12, 18 inches, pulled all that up, and then put down um, gravel, decorative gravel, where the burrows were. And the gravel is such size where the rodents have a hard time burrowing into it. So little things like that go a long way with pest management. And things like this, like we saw before, trash, um, spilling outside of trash cans, recycling, um, can attract not only rodents, you know, cockroaches, um, yellow jackets. We see them attract, attracted to areas like this in the summertime. Um, this here uh, is not only a good place to draw attention or attract rodents, um, but over in here where this tarp has um, gathered, there's water in here and there was actually mosquito larvae living in that water. So you'll learn more about mosquitoes at some point during um, your training. Um, and that is a source of, for mosquitoes to lay their eggs. So that was a double whammy there. So with exclusion with rodents, um, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're larger, um, but you, the holes that they can fit through, I'll tell people, remember the 35 cents rule. 
So mice can get through an opening the size of a dime or smaller. Rats can get through an opening the size of a quarter or larger. So that's what folks want to be looking at when they're looking around the outside of their buildings. And you, screening can be used. Um, metal, sheet metal right here. Um, plaster, caulk. Um, the foam, I think I've got a picture on the, yeah. The expandable foam um, works, but you see here they've also got some hardware cloth attached to. That's because rodents are pretty good at getting through expandable foam. So let's look at now some extreme rodent sports. Some of these are going to, pictures are, might be kind of yucky. I will go ahead and warn you. Um, we're going to be talking about rodent trapping and rodent baiting. Rodent trapping works best with small populations uh, because of the need for frequent trap inspections. So if you think about it, if you're putting out traps, you're going to end up with, hopefully, the point of the traps is some dead rodents. So those dead rodents are going to start to, you know, smell if they're not removed regularly. So um, it's easier if there's a smaller infestation. Not only that, you have to reset and rebate traps. So it can be a big project. So they make all different types of snap traps. This is your standard wooden trap. They make them for mice. They make larger ones for rats. So you can get those in a variety of sizes. Um, they make plastic ones, like you can see here with some metal snaps. Um, this is plastic here, which reminds me of a chip clip, but not quite a chip clip. Uh, this is one that's put inside of a box, and you might be wondering why that is. Um, it's because, you know, if you ever have to put a trap somewhere in a situation where, you know, you could have a child trying to get to the trap accidentally or on purpose, you know, somebody that's curious or a dog or a cat, then you can put it in these tamper resistant boxes. And you see, this is the lid here. So once you get the trap in there, the lid just folds over and closes and it locks. And the rodent comes in these openings here. So that can be effective as well. Sticky traps can also be used for rodents. Some people are not a fan of them because you know they, they don't kill the rodent as quickly as a snap trap, but they are an option. Um, what you're seeing here on the left is a trap with a plexiglass top, and it's got a sticky trap in it. So the plexiglass top there just enables someone who's monitoring those traps to see what's going in there without having to opening every, open every single trap, which can be cumbersome if you've got a lot of them. Now these do need to be placed in strategic places, so remember that rodents run along walls, um, they don't see very well, so we always want to place the traps with the openings along the wall, like you see here. That's good placement right there. Or near doors, okay, like this, and in corners. Um, and again, glue traps work, but they don't kill the rodents immediately, so that's something to keep in mind. Patience is a necessity. Uh, so remember, rats can be neophobic, so with trapping like this, sometimes they can take longer to trap rats. So sometimes they have to be pre-baited. And then as I mentioned before, we do have toxic baits for rodent control. And this is best left to professionals, again, because most of these products are they, they're anticoagulants. That means they work by causing internal hemorrhaging. That's how they kill the rodents. So. Um, you know, sometimes we hear cases of a dog getting ingesting enough of these to where they end up at the vet. Um, it is reversible if they get there in time and depending on how much they ingest, but we want to avoid that if at all possible. Um, so we usually use the bait outdoors in these bait stations. So you can see this is a bait station here, like you saw the one with that trap in. This is just closed, and instead of having the trap in it, the snap trap, we put bait blocks in it, and I'll show you how those look in a minute. Never use pellet bait, especially indoors, so we don't want this indoors, because if you think about this pellet bait just being open like this, if a rat or mouse could come along there and move that around, or who knows could get in there, you just don't know and find that. So 
best not to do it inside. If it, it does need to be put inside, they make little bait boxes that can be put inside where they're, they're um, tamper resistant and lockable. So these are what they look like when you open them. The bait, this is kind of old bait here, and that's what they'll do is they'll come out during part of their service and they'll exchange out the old bait, put new bait in there, but they're blocks and they slide on these metal rods that fit in here in the station. And then you close it up and lock it and you see he's got it put on this piece of cinder block here so it's not easily movable. If a dog were to come along there and try to pick that thing up or a child were to come along and try to pick that thing up and shake it, one, it'd be hard to pick up and shake it. Two, the bait wouldn't come out of there very easily because it's going to be on those rods. So that's to minimize that stuff being moved to areas it shouldn't be. They need to be checked regularly like this person's doing here and the bait switched out, as I mentioned. And they need to be secured like you saw before on that cinder block. And sometimes we do run into problems like this where you see bait not put on the rods. People get lazy or tired and they just throw them in there like this. But what can happen with that is you end up with some of it outside the box. And that's a pretty good chunk there. So we recommend that folks don't do that. They put them on the rods. That's what those rods are meant for in those stations. So we do discourage baiting indoors. Um, check the traps in areas daily because again if you're dealing with trapping or baiting presumably you're going to have some dead rodents so they need to be disposed of as soon as possible. One, it just nobody wants to see it if they happen to see it and two, it might cause an odor. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. Um, so um, what I'll do real quick here, um, I'll try, let's see if I can do this.